following program may contain coarse language, suggestive dialogue, and discussion of violent imagery and sexual situations. It is intended for mature listeners who can tell the difference between facts and opinions. It's more Anime Ricks and more Anime Mortys on this episode of the Toonami Faithful Podcast. I am your host, Sketch, and with me, I have... Bob Skrillo, the founder of ToonamiFaithful.com. And we have a special guest. Hi, I'm Lum Ramiyasha, and I'm on Toonami Faithful Podcast, Morty. I'm Toonami Faithful Lum! That's too much energy. I'm glad one of us is excited. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul is dying over there. I just got off work and... We're talking about Rick and Morty, the anime. So, I'm, I'm actually not that bad well, tonight, honestly. But I don't have that much energy. I will say that. Well, keeping it chill and low energy fits the tone of the show, I would say. Which also, compared to regular Rick and Morty, is uh, pretty low key. Not as manic. Not as yelly. Yeah, mm. I would completely agree with that. It's it's very the opposite of in your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that, yeah. too. So last time, we sort of kind of talked about the first three episodes, <laughs> though, honestly, I felt like that discussion just kind of d- d- didn't go anywhere for the most part <laughs> and was mainly a whole lot of, uh, we don't know if we like this show. <laughs> well, I we, think we that... must strive to do better this time. <laughs> I just re-listened to your discussion today and was, like, mostly negative on the show. It's like, man, I don't like this. I do not like watching this at all. And I think Paul was the one way he's like, you know what? It's fine. I, I like it. And, and I'll be honest, I'm still of that opinion. Um, I mean, I don't know if we're going to just, you know, go through each episode, but I would say out of the three that we just, that we're doing tonight, like, what is it? I want to say episode five really felt like an, an episode of uh, Rick and Morty. That I really that agree. Mm. Especially since it was the most kind of isolated, the most that felt like it was, you know, episodic, whereas the rest of the yeah. episodes have been leading one into another in a more serialized way. Like yeah. episode five is one where, you know, I could see a version of this episode in the regular series. Obviously, it would be more punched up. It would be more jokey. Um, yeah. It would probably go to like more audacious and dark and, uh, you know, wilder places. But like, uh, yeah, it's like in terms of the plot, like Rick helping Jerry becoming a superhero, like that's, I mean, there's a version of that episode in regular Rick and Morty in, in terms of Jerry becoming a superhero. And I could see like a version of that story playing out in regular Rick and Morty, though I think it would have gone again in a completely different direction because the tone of the shows are so different. You know, I, I'm going to be mm-hmm. honest with you. I, I really wish that maybe episode five was kind of in the actual Rick and Morty because I think that would have been a perfect episode in the season. But just because, like, it, it seemed like, even though, like, he was a superhero, and by the way, that by that that was probably my favorite episode out of the three. Um, it, it it felt like there should have been more action to it, but I kind of understood. Yeah, I kind of understood what they were trying to do. So I mean, it wasn't anything bad. I will say, I like the fact that they actually made. Um, is, is that supposed to be the prime um, reality where, like, remember Rick screwed it up? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Cronenberg it's universe. The Cro- it's a version of the Cronenberg universe where yeah, the show started so out for the first six episodes before they I switched. loved the fact that that um, Jerry got some time because I was like, okay, that's pretty awesome. Because when you saw him in the regular season, you kind of were like, well, this is... This is kind of stupid. 
Uh, but this this or Joe is, Daniels is like you got to be Rick, you got to be Jerry. Oh, by the way, there's more than one Jerry and more than and one more Rick. One Rick. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's not just playing two characters; he's playing like <laughs> six characters if you count all these different versions. And, and by the way, like I, I I love that version of Jerry. I wish I wish we would see more of that that version of Jerry. I it, well, I don't even, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if Adult Swim listens to us, but give me more of that Jerry because I want to see I want to see more story of that Jerry. Um, well, unfortunately, in the regular series, I don't think that's going to happen because what happened to the character, which is why I was really happy to see him a version of that character be so prominent in the show and actually meet with like our main Jerry and have them bounce off each other and like the Cronenberg version Jerry actually be an encouragement of hey we're both Jerry's so I know that you are more capable than you think because you know I became like this total like badass in this like you know uh world that went to hell where I'm fighting like Cronenberg monsters all the time so he gives cool. that other Jerry the confidence to like yeah you can be a hero you do have the the you can use the sword this. and the suit and you can protect your family. Well, yeah. Uh, so I really like the dynamic between those two versions of Jerry. And I like J Joe Daniels performance as him. It's like just, you know, matter of factly confident. And, you know, I am also the, the Jerry Smith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I got to say like uh, that, um, that episode actually set up for that Jerry to do something else because of, you know, like all of a sudden, that the last scene that we see him and he's like standing, not standing, but he's like over the city, so to speak. So it's like, okay, well, this will be interesting. Plus, he has a portal gun, so I'm a little, I'm a little scared <laughs> to to know what he's about to do yeah, because he could potentially yeah. show up again. He's been a bit of a reoccurring character in this so yeah i mean he appeared in the very first episode and he had credit stinger so he's been set up and i could see him especially with the portal gun him have a role in like kind of the climax of the show maybe make a surprise heel turn you know maybe there's like more to him coaching uh the regular universe jerry and then like you're trying to lo learn more about the sword than we were led on to believe in the same way, like maybe there's there's pr definitely more going on with L than she's letting on oh, yeah. to, for us to believe. So, well, and, and I was gonna it'll say, be interesting like, to see. I, I found it interesting that, by the way, I think this is a better way to discuss this sketch than going over three all three episodes because I think I agree with you. Last time we were kind of like, eh, you know, so. Um, the, hey, the show jumps around, so we might as well in our discussion, too. Exactly, exactly. Um, That's fair. <laughs> so, so maybe the interesting maybe thing about, about that episode is that it was arguably the most linear, but it was still not quite linear. Right, especially right. because they had this concept of like the anti universe where time flows in a different direction. Did did anybody so, else think that he said any universe? I, I did yeah. think he said that at first. I thought he said any verse. Especially I was because like, he that, makes a, a comment the about the animation at, yeah. right afterwards. Like, don't expect the animation to be split screen or move backwards or whatever. That's too complicated. But <laughs> no. Well, but, so. Yeah. I don't I don't know if you guys noticed this, but it seems like episode one through five, well, one through four, I should say, were like all over the place. And then they brought Jerry back to it, to the the timeline that he's currently in in the show. Um, and then yeah, obviously, episode five was with Jerry. I mean, it was it just seemed like I said, it seemed like a normal episode of Rick and Morty. Maybe that's on purpose, but whatever. Um, and then I think it's six. kind of like a breeder episode for the middle of the show because yeah. we kind of had like a a breaking point in the plot with the rescue of Rick and then Human L kind of ingratiating herself with the Smith family. So this is kind of like an intermission where we kind of get an episodic one off focusing on Jerry before we resume the main plot in the subsequent episode and presumably through to the end of the season. And, so, and, it, and it's I, nice to give Jerry a focus episode because he right. was kind of like separate from all the other characters who were involved with like what was going on with like Rick lost between dimensions and the stuff going on with Al. Like all the rest of the Smith family were like all involved and like trying to find Rick and 
figuring that stuff out. But Jerry was like off on his own baking his spaceberry cake and fiddling in Rick's garage. So it's good to get him some spotlight. And and what I was going to say is if it feels like episode six is the start of kind of where this is actually supposed to be going. So, Mm -hmm. um, and and I don't, so I I think there is more to, to L, but I think it just doesn't seem like she's a bad guy because I I wonder because in episode four, she's very clearly the one responsible for Rick, like hopping between different dimensions into different Rick realities. And she makes this comment to Rick of, you know, all you need to do is validate my existence and you can be guided back to your regular dimension And then it seems like, you know, Rick is resisting this, but then eventually she ends up wearing him down. And then when they're back in their regular reality, she like Rick is also like kind of still a little suspicious of her and saying, well, what do you want me to do with like this, you know, like. uh, What was it called? The particle thing where yeah like uh, how do we want me to use it because it's clearly tied yeah. the antimatter thing but what do you how do you want me to use it because it's clearly tied to your existence and she's like being coy of like you know you you do what you think best but i think it's very clear that she's keeping things from rick and she's trying to guide things in a particular direction contrary to what she's saying about oh i believe in free will because there's this comment made about like if the people who could foresee time yes. that were destroyed by the Federation had actually interfered and changed the future and changed fate, you know, what would have happened? And it seems that she is trying to like change fate by like trying to subtly influence the course of Rick's decision mm. by like becoming so, you know, beloved by Morty and the rest of the Smith family that oh. there would be no threat to the erasure of existence because they would She goes her. to school with Morty and nobody acknowledges that anything's different. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind so of she... like how the show is, to be honest with you. Because she's inserted her... Okay, okay, this is great. This is great. Remember that guy in the full ring arc of Bleach that can yes. insert himself into oh my God. people's he's, pasts? She's so much like Tsukushima. Yeah, she's like, oh, you can remember... She's like... And this might tell you into like a space bet remembering her save her. It's like yeah. maybe she wasn't actually there. Maybe she's created this false memory to make her like seem more trustworthy. This can also explain why when she, Rick is like and her are found together back in the regular dimension, while Rick seems to be more like friendly and accommodating her when previously he had been a much less trustworthy antagonistic towards her when he was hopping between dimensions and was recognizing you are the cause of why this is happening to me. You are trying to make me do something. So yeah, I think that would explain quite a bit about like mm-hmm. why the characters are so accepting of hell and why they seem to have memories of her. I I, I yeah. do want to know, and maybe there's maybe there's a reason for this, but um, they do say that sh- that she knows like she has memories of the f- oh it was it was Birdman that said this um that she she has memories of the future. So she knows what's going to happen. The the interesting part that I don't understand, and maybe maybe there maybe there's a reason for this, but she she's like connected to Morty in some way. And I that's yeah, kind of and the question I, is, is it because of the VR simulation or did it come about some other way? Right. Is it real, even like a same version of L as Alien L that we're seeing in the space Morty timeline? and flashbacks where you know that in that version that morty joins the defiance and really becomes close with and more alien looking version of l who i think studios episodes is heavily implied to be of the same like species planet that we see in the opening scene of the very first episode that is threatened to be destroyed by the federation that we later see is thwarted and where the sword comes from and all that. Oh, yeah. We never see her take on that human form in that timeline, do we? 
No, I, no. I think it's a completely separate version of L that was created somehow, or is it even the same L or a manifestation that's created by like this antimatter thing to protect it by creating this like kind of human like um like sympathetic avatar that the smith family would want to protect and thus not like tread in its existence and, it, and this and it is, is all terrorizing it is interesting that we keep going back to that original planet too because was it episode was it episode six where they they showed it was either episode five or episode six where they showed, it's episode five in the jerry episode where we show like the uh, Federation plan being thwarted to blow up yeah, their planet. Destroyed. And yeah. they talk about how the sword comes from their planet. And they get yeah, Mr. Red. Nimbus explains all that. I loved seeing Mr. Nimbus. Yeah. So, and I loved so, what he called Rick in his phone, his phone ID. It was shit Lord of the sea. Yeah. So what was that I song? Mean, Is that, was that song used in original Rick and Morty? I can't remember. I'd have to rewatch the original Rick and the Nimbus episode. I need to it find that song. Like it was created for the show. I need to yeah, find I did that like song. it. It's nice. I, I do find it. It's interesting to me that they keep going back to that. So maybe, and I could be wrong. Maybe she prevented that, and maybe she is part of that society and whatever. Um, she's part of that. She she saved them, and maybe that's what her exist. Maybe that's what's going on. Is these people aren't supposed to be alive, but they are. So I don't know how that's going to play into it because it does keep going back to that, and, and I find it really interesting that they brought it up in episode six where they're like, "Oh, there's these these people that can see the future." But the Federation destroyed them because they could be a threat, basically. And I'm like, okay, so are those people the ones that are the pacifists that don't fight back? And somehow hmm. they got saved. Yeah. You know, because Alien L does kind of look like them, but not really. They're they're kind of like kind of they got different head shapes. Yeah. I mean, there could be some, like, you know, differentiation in their species. The eyes feel a little similar. But yeah. just the fact that they're describing this concept and then we're seeing this planet being, like, spread in the opening scene of the very first episode and maybe come back to it, like, several episodes later, it feels like it's very relevant and integrated into, like, what's going on with L beyond like this is where the sword came from that was like using the fifth episode and I feel like there's probably more going on with that sword too. Yeah, it's interesting that the sword contains like the the power and the fighting spirit of that entire species that have become pacifists. I am I am starting to think by the way that um space mom as they call her um I, I do space think Bev. that Space Bev, but they, they call her Space Mom. Um, I, I'm starting to think that maybe she's the prime Beth because she's the one that's like more suspicious and the other Beth is like, eh, they're going to break up at some point. It's, it's just going to be the way it is. And she's like, no, no, no. I need to figure out what's going on with this because this doesn't sit right with me. So it's I... I don't know. I, I feel like she might be the prime Beth, but that's that's something totally different. Well, yeah. All, I mean, all they ever do is make occasional jabs at, whoa, maybe I'm the real one. Oh, yeah, okay, which, is, okay, okay. which is interesting because, you know, in the regular series, they were like, you know what? Who cares who is real Beth? You know, <laughs> who cares, screw you, Rick. baby? Screw you, Rick. We're, Who's the we're just real dandy? This. It's just cool. <laughs> That we have two space bombs, two bets. Uh, but like in this show, it seems that there is actually still some tension between these versions of Bet and Space Bet about like which one is the original and which one is the clone. And I think that ties into these like overarching themes of the show is in exploring about memory and the trustworthiness of memory and people's relationship to time and how that influences that. Yeah. It should be. I, I'm. I'm really interested to see what the next episodes reveal because 
I mean, I feel like there's there's going to be some. Well, I hope there's going to be some kind of actual um, point to this because if it ends up at the end where this was just uh, no, sorry, Paul, none of this matters. It anti matters. <laughs> uh, the worst thing that could happen is like if the entire plot of the show is somehow like a race through some time rewind shenanigans well i mean then, in episode five they mind blew everybody well that's a little different at least then like you know it happened it's just like I and mean, it's like they made the choice of like yeah we're going to remove our memories like in jerry's case especially it's like oh this is a nice character moment where he's like you know what i in appreciated getting the chance to be this hero but what i i through this i realized that i appreciate just being you know a family man and spending time with my family so uh, i want to kind of go back to the version of myself i used to be so like that works i think from a character moment you know but well, like yeah just was... like i think but rick that's, also you know... just did it to everybody when they got back from yeah so the I, think that, mm-hmm. I think that scene was when he first did it to him because if you remember that yes. that was in the past or not in the past it was in the I, I think piecing it together uh so he he puts him through the training which involves tentacles because of course <laughs> yeah. so yeah. he puts him through the training and then he gives him the super suit and he's like all right go out there and be a hero and i think that's when he fights the yakuza group get the sword and then after that he erases his memory yeah, yes. that makes sense because yeah. he does mention in like the battle with the Yakuza group before yeah. the end credits that, yeah, you erased my memories and I remember that. But so that's like, that's the anti verse Jerry that did all of that, mm-hmm. but it's the main universe Jerry that fought the the Yakuza the second time, mm-hmm. and love- evidently that uh, that the. Uh, leader of the Yakuza group showed up in uh, Rick and Morty versus the Genocider. He was the Yakuza guy that Morty bumped into with the public bath. Yeah. And he recognizes Morty and even asks, hey, do you want to be my successor? And and Jerry's like, no, Morty is my son. I was in kids in that. I love how the the daughter is still like trying to get with Jerry. (laughs) And he's like, yeah. She's like, who are these? Who are these women? And they're like, <laughs> and they're, they're like, like, oh, it turns out you had wives. wives. <laughs> oh, you had wives. Yeah, yeah, because he totally blocks her advances earlier. Mm-hmm. Like, I ain't got time for that. <laughs> Check him. Also, my wife would probably kick my ass. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But you know, and it's funny. I mean, this like, Jerry is much less weak will than regular Rick and Morty Jerry. Yeah. Like yeah. even like in the version himself, who's not like a super confident hero, he's so much more like chill and like mellow and not like really letting other characters get under his skin like regular series uh, Jerry. He's like, oh, I'm off baking my cake and enjoying baking my cake. Yeah. And, and when then, he's oh, attacked by a fish person, he's like, here, have some cake. Yeah. <laughs> it's not poison. <laughs> very, very nice. The people. Uh, that's a kind of a a big difference, I think, in the characterization mm. of everyone in in the show compared to their uh, right main series counterparts. Is that everyone is mm. so much like nicer? They're kind of the most like selfless versions of themselves compared yeah. to in regular Rick and Morty, where everyone is antagonistic to each other and mean to each other, especially Rick. You know, the Rick and Rick and Morty, the anime, is, like, so much more kinder to Morty. Even in the scenes where he's like, Morty, you shouldn't have done that. He's not, like, you know, berating him. He's, like, kind of giving a little sigh of, like, oh, Morty, you know, I was go- going to do this things, but oh, well. So it's, like, interesting that these versions of... And it it's kind of goes back to, like, that genocider short too, where I felt like those versions of those characters just were much more sincere and kinder to each other. That kind of is carried over yeah. into this version, uh, the full, you know, Rick and Morty anime, too. And I, I think that's a huge difference of, like, where the, you know, source of the humor comes from compared to, like, the main series, or rather maybe the lack 
of similar humor and just kind of the tone of the show. And that the series feels much more sincere and interested in exploring like the relationships between these characters in a way that it's not like, you know, how in the original series, it's like Rick is like kind of manipulating and like verbally abusing other characters to like do so they would like acquiesce to what he wants them to do. And then in this series, it's like so much more like, oh, there's there's a little more consideration between the characters for each other. Or it's like there there aren't like big blowouts or big digs at each other of like how much they secretly hate or resent each other mm-hmm. that like he, explode into inner family conflicts. Yes, he's way more sincere and not nihilistic and like as opposed to nihilistic, he's really just more zen. He's he's over yeah. it. It's like, hey, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, everyone's more chill and willing to just let, you know, what comes be. But then, yeah, main series, Rick and Morty, like Rick is like, you know, you're a fool for caring about things, except for the select things that I choose to care about. You know, it's literally a conversation he has with third person. It's like, well, wait, nothing matters because you can change different universes. Well, yeah, but you know, you matter to me, and then that's not really the the tone of this show as well, at all. It's like, you know, like all the stuff that these characters go through and their relations with each other do matter, even when they're like hopping universe, or even if it's like a different version of a person that they know, which is really interesting. Yeah, you know. I I had some issue with them incorporating Tammy out of the blue previously as a, as a cyborg. Just kind of like, okay, if you're not that familiar with Rick and Morty, you, you're completely lost here. But, you know, they even showed her origin story here, so... Yeah, I really enjoy that. Like, <laughs> Tammy was kidnapped by the Federation and, like brainwashed and trained to be like a spy soldier for them and then sent back to earth to like become summer's friend and spy on the smiths and all that so yeah mm-hmm. I, I like them actually showing that and it also i think kind of gives the again this version of tammy is also i think much more sincere it seems about like actually of having had a relationship with Burbers and based on the ending of that second episode where she's like kind of like shocked to see bird person and bird daughter like waiting in front of her apartment. And the fact that she also like lives to reunite with them in this universe and this version of the series is also kind of a nice touch com- considering, you know, she gets killed off in the original and she seems to have been much more just manipulative and not actually having care about anyone else at any point in, in her like undercover stint of like getting close to the Smiths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are some uh, fun little Easter eggs here and there, like the nuggets with the special sauce. Come on, we all know. (laughs) We all know what that's referencing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, hey, you know, he uses it as a as a foil to to sneak in. They're like, oh, we've captured you. It's like, oh, that was way too easy. Now let me show you something that my grandpa taught me and also something that L taught me. This Morty's kind of a badass. <laughs> yeah, a much more confident version of Morty. You know, it's, yeah. it's really interesting to see. Like this M- Morty really finds a lot of purpose and like pride in becoming like a member of the Defiance and eventually, a, I suppose, a leader in it. And then, mm-hmm. like, kind of his relationship with L also, like, helps bolster that confidence. But, yeah, that was actually a really interesting ploy. Admittedly, when I first watched the that scene in that episode, I, because, like, you know, it was such, obviously, Morty's voice, I thought, like, oh, Morty, like, you know, just ended up getting himself arrested. And I didn't realize, oh, he was, like, in disguise. And he actually did fool the Federation guys to, like, you know, be brought into, like, the prison and whatever so he could, like sabotage it and destroy it from the inside so but yeah like pretty actually uh smart strategies from space morty mm-hmm. <clears throat> i like actually, that uh space beth gave them fair warning 
if you mess with me, <laughs> Rick Sanchez is coming. And in the post credit scene, Rich Rick Rick uh, rolls up just like she warned them. You were warned, shithead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see what he does to them, but knowing Rick, uh, it's definitely not pretty. So, I mean, this again, this is a kinder Rick, seemingly. So he's not going to. So far in the show, we have not seen the protagonist, the Smith family, just brazenly, wantedly, and without any disregard, killing people uh, just because. Or yeah, just because this, this way. is a far cry from. They're robots, Morty. Wait, no, he wasn't a robot. Is like, but <laughs> they were basically robots, and I hate them. Yeah, it's like that's it's just your opinion. <laughs> you made me kill somebody. Yeah. 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 Well, honestly, I'm just not really sure what I think of the show at this point, but um. Glad that you guys are finding things to uh, latch on to. I mean, yeah, I think the show is really coming together now. Like what they're trying to do with the story is starting to connect. And so, like, even thinking about it and theorizing about it, it's like, oh, this is interesting what, you know, they're trying to kind of do here between these connections with characters and the way that they're like exploring these different points of time and the trustworthiness of what we're, of what we are seeing on screen and what the characters are remembering actually happened. So, yeah, I think that all oh, that's really interesting. Again, I think um, the uh, w- the show is just such a different tone from regular Rick and Morty and it started so slow. And in general, the episodes, they just don't have like kind of the, the manic pace and energy of regular Rick and Morty that it's really easy to see why people who are more accustomed to regular Rick and Morty would like kind of fall off with that. The show is much more like contemplative and like uh, in a way that it's not really humor focused. It's much more like this character driven story focus, which is interesting because like so many Rick and Morty fans like criticize the main series and being like, we want more serialized stories. We want more lore episodes, more. Well, how about episodes. a whole season of it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Like this is kind no, of what fans have been wanting. It's too from much. <laughs> Rick and Morty, but I think also like the it's not satisfying folks who want that in a way because it's not you know, as clear a linear narrative because it is bouncing off so much because it is like not even in Rick and Morty episodes in the original series that kind of play with different dimensions and time and stuff. There's kind of more of a clear like grounding, but here things are like, you know, interspliced in a way that it can be easy to be a little disoriented and it helps to like kind of rewatch the episodes and see how the pieces connect together. But like week to week and especially starting out like in the moment, it was hard to figure out like what is the tread, the storage tread to really latch on to here and where are they really going with this now at this point in the show i think we have a much clearer sense of like what they're trying to do what it's interested in so i'm personally like really intrigued to see how it concludes but i can see how this just wouldn't vibe with people who are fans of just like the humor of rick and morty and just the tone the sensibilities of that of the original series because this is like such a different show tonally and these versions of these characters are so different from the regular series characters again it loses kind of the cynical irreverence of the regular series for a much more sincere optimistic contemplative uh tone and i think that it also throws people off who are like more used to that so it like because it almost feels in some respects, oh, this is like Rick and Morty, but like kind of with the edges sanded off. And I personally think it's like doing something more interesting with the characters and that in terms of how it's playing on characters as they were established in Rick and Morty and like reinterpreting them uh, with this like kind of new tone and new focus on their relationships in a different way from like antagonistic combative relationships they had in the original series to something that's like kind of more well how do these characters like affect each other in kind of like positive ways and supportive ways but yeah it's just 
such a departure from what I think people expected, and especially in like what they might expect from a Rick and Morty anime. I think so many people would expect this could be a show that'd be like more of a send up of anime tropes and genres, more bombastic uh, in its parody, like with the Voltron episode with the, like the, the the Gotron parody or, and then like the Rick and two crows, like, anime opening and parody thing uh there's like the anime parodies in the regular series i think they might people might expect more of that tone and that more poking fun of anime tropes this doesn't really fit like what i think people's perceptions of like what a rick and morty anime would be i think takashi sana even said this what the series wasn't even originally going to be called rick and morty anime it was going to be called rick and morty like beyond the something or whatever i forget what but honestly they, I, I wish it had a different title yeah i understand for marketing purposes while i called it rick and morty anime but i also think it created different expectations of what kind of show it would be than yeah. what it has ended up being so yeah i can i think the criticisms of the early episodes especially are like fairly valid in terms of like just not a feeling disoriented uh, with like what, how the show is presenting the characters, the lack of the same rapid fire humor, and then the like kind of disjointed nonlinear narrative. But I do think that, you know, as a reinterpretation of Rick and Morty, it's like Takashi Sano's like love letter to the series and like also an exploration of these themes of like time and memory. Um, I think it's actually, I think it's pretty interesting. You know, it's, I, what, I don't know if it's still, like, something that in the moment when I'm watching the episode, I'm, like, the most excited and most satisfied at the end of the episode. But then thinking about it later, like, rewatching the episodes for this podcast and talking about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, these are really interesting connections to think about and theorize. And it makes me really look forward to see how things end up resolving and how things will end up coming together. And I'm crossing my fingers it comes together in a satisfying way. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the uh, the all too common problem of <laughs> Adult Swim original anime when yeah. they don't come together at the end. <laughs> uh, okay, it's not a super strong track record. Like even with Ninja Kamui, I was like, that ending is so abrupt. I could use I could have used more denouement, maybe less less focus on certain other characters, so we could have more. Or mm. more of a satisfying closure rather than, oh, we beat the bad guy 30 seconds later, it's the end. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I think Lumi basically summed it up pretty well. Um, I, I would... Yeah. Whatever. I mean, I, I would say, you know, for me, I just would like to see where this goes. I mean... I, I could be honest with you. At the end of this, I could probably be like, "Yeah, I don't know why I um, why I watch this, but you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like I said, this is better than most of the seasons after season three of Rick and Morty, and that's still true. I don't see. I I'm a I'm a Rick and Morty fan. I don't know if I would necessarily go that route. Uh, even though season three, I think, is my favorite Rick and Morty season. So by default, like the rest of the seasons don't quite measure up to that for me. But I still think that there's a lot of value in the seasons. Um, I mean, there's a lot of enjoyment. I really enjoy a lot of episodes. They can usually knock it out of the park, especially with the more story or lower focus episodes. But I think, yeah, there. I guess that's another thing, though, is that the tone of Rick and Morty, you know, the there's only so much that you can really jive with it's like kind of uh irreverent cynicism about like the world and about what matters to these characters or not and like the characters being mean to each other i mean in always sunny shows like that pull it off but i think after a while because rick and morty also has this flip side of like well we want to show that these characters have kind of deeper feelings and like things that they're working through particularly with rick and his like kind of baggage and traumas and you know stuff that he has to kind of you know let his like emotional guards down and actually confront rather than like uh mask it all with like kind of this carefree i don't give a shit about anything personality 
Uh, I think after a certain while, you're want you want to see kind of just like the show start to kind of like move away from things that don't feel like they're really progressing the characters or like are kind of progressing them. And like obviously, the dynamic of the characters in Rick and Morty has changed a lot in recent seasons compared to the early seasons. Like the family is not so like differential to Rick; they give him sh- shit for stuff. Uh, now and like Morty's more willing to stand up to him and not take his crap anymore. Rick has learned to like try sometimes to be like more, you know, considerate of the rest of his family, though still uh, there end up being regressions like with his, you know, obsession with finding Rick Prime in uh, the end of season six and into season seven and all that. But, um, yeah, I think it's just, like, there there just felt like a point where the kind of the status quo of Rick and Morty was stagnating to a point that frustrated, like, a lot of fans. And also there were a lot of just episodes based around a joke or a style of humor that people really just didn't jive with. Like, you know, the whole, like, semen monster episode that led to the Intus baby that was an episode that people uh, generally didn't like. <laughs> and I, I like the 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 self says We can all the say that panty and stocking did it better. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, there, there are a lot of episodes that just have like a concept that like, you know, it seemed it it didn't fe- it just didn't kind of have like the twist on it or like play into like an expression of characters in a way that was really satisfying to a lot of people from what I think they, they really want from the show uh, at this point, which is why like people are most excited and most satisfied when we get story episodes, because that those are end up being like the ones that have like catharsis and like the emotional payoffs alongside usually some pretty good jokes that play into like the, the story. But um, with this show, I think, again, it's, like, much more story-focused. So, again, it's kind of giving fans what they have been frustrated they're not getting as much as the original show. But the uh, trade-off point is that it doesn't have the humor that dr- brought people into Rick and Morty and what they enjoy so much about Rick and Morty, too. So I would say I, – I wouldn't say it's, like, better – than a lot of the later seasons of Rick and Morty. It reaches the highs, at least, of the best episodes of the seasons. But in a way, it's more focused than those mm. later seasons in terms of, like, what it's setting out yeah, to hear do. That, listeners? This show actually is focused. You just, you know, got to take it all in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the it's focused in terms of a thematic point and, like, what it's trying to build towards. And if not, like, the experience of actually, like, watching it as a linear narrative. But in comparison to main series Rick and Morty, which is like, well, these are mostly episodic things that go in different directions from a starting point of, like, oh, this is where we thought, like, this, the show was going to go into and we had more exploration of this. But then it can't, but then it ends up no we're we're back to episodic stuff and uh, I think that really is where a lot of people just had been frustrated with regular series Rick and Morty for a lot of the the more recent seasons. Mm. I don't think well we could, I don't think we need to really <laughs> say anything more I think we <laughs> there's talkbacks. <laughs> well, right, I was going to get to that. I yeah, guess uh, I, one I final just stray thing that I don't think I just brought up is that uh, I really appreciate the prominence of Space Bed in the show. I think she's an underutilized character in uh-huh. main series Rick and Morty, but there's a lot of focus on her in the show. I think, I guess, Takashi Sano really likes her, but she's an interesting character, you and I have really seen her interact with the family more and uh, uh, go other see more of her is not really getting a lot of screen time. <laughs> Yeah, but I like the interactions between Space Bet and Regular Bet from the the scenes they do share with each other. And hopefully we'll see more of that going forward. You know, I was perplexed when uh, Space Beth showed up to get Morty and Summer and they're like, okay, we're going to go find Rick. And the other Beth is like, I'm coming with you. And the kids are like, uh, like, what? (laughs) That's I think it's like Space Bet is the cool mom. And then, like, regular <laughs> yeah. bet is kind of like the 
overbearing protective mom. And they're like, oh, space bat allows us to have fun and go on these like daring space, um, like, you know, resistance you know, that does fighter check missions. Out. They are teenagers. Yeah. And Summer, you know, as we've seen, is spending a lot of time like with Space Bed and like work and Rick and, and working with like the defiance or resistance or yeah, whatever she's against like the Federation. The guy in the chair. Yeah. With a gal in the chair, as it were. Yeah. I like that dynamic too. I don't think Summer has been like we've seen a ton of summer outside of the first episode, but I do like how they playing into this idea that was established in like later Rick Morty seasons of summer being kind of like the person that Rick can kind of trust the most to be his number two in a way, like with the Gotron episode or like even in the night family episode where the like night version of her is kind of like the leader of this mid family. It's like, she's kind of the one that can actually like match up to like his intelligence or like kind of get what he he wants and what he's going for in a way that even more Morty understands him, but Morty's less willing to like go along with Rick, but Summer is more game. So I, I think that's an interesting dynamic to continue to explore with this show. <laughs> I mean, let's never forget that the two of them decided to get swole to beat up the devil. Yeah, oh my God, that was my favorite part. Well, not my favorite part, but it was one of the highlights of the wrestling show at San Diego Comic-Con. Is like, yeah, I don't know if you guys saw or talked about this, but like at San Diego Comic Con, you know, they did this AEW X Adult Swift like wrestling team show yeah, where you had a, as one tag team match, it was Fang and Meat Wad, and they lost. And then another tag team match, uh, they had like Rachel and Mr. Frog is kind of the the heels for that round. And they also lost. But in the final round between the AEW two winning teams, like uh, Mr. Frog and uh, Rachel came out and they helped the heels from AEW. And they were beating up on the faces from AEW. But then Buff Summer and Buff Rick came in and help the faces <laughs> beat the heels out. And then so the the belt kick went to both the, the to the faces of AEW and Buff Summer and Buff Rick. And that was a, a delightful surprise and highlight because they were not on the tickets. So they, they oh, came out of nowhere. That's and, a twist uh, ending. That was, yeah, it was a great twist and very funny. Uh, so I, I quite enjoyed. That was that wrestling show that uh, AEW exited also in wrestling show was definitely a highlight of, of that San Diego Comic-Con. Interesting. Um, I guess I didn't talk about it, but, you know, I also, you know, saw the premiere of the the show, Rick and Morty Anime, at San Diego Comic Con as part of the night of premieres. And I will say just, you know, it came at the end of the screenings after, like, showing, you know, common side effects, women wearing shoulder pads, Invincible Fight Girl. I will say that the show did get the least reaction of all those shows, like, least laughs and stuff. I think the, mm. the laugh that got most was, like, when Jerry was, like, Hey, I oh hey, I knew I didn't uh, make a mistake. I just clogged the toilet or whatever. And then like the the, at least I remember really laughing at it. The um, Citizen Kane parody, but oh, mostly yeah. people were kind of like silent. And then overhearing after the screening, people talk about what their highlights were, what they really enjoyed. I admit I heard a lot of people say that they they Rick and Morty was probably the least favorite of the premieres. Not like people were saying, oh, I hated this, but they were like, eh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but like it wasn't as like entertaining as the rest of them. And I will say also, I have noticed that on Max, while the show was like regularly in the top 10 uh, after a new episode debuted uh, on Max, like now I'm as of the fifth episode, I'm not seeing the show rank in the top 10 anymore. So I do wonder if there has been a drop off on of people to show streaming on Max, which mm. is kind of a shame now that the show has kind of found its groove. But yeah, oh I've well. also noticed a, a a steady decline in conversation. Yeah, week to week. Which, uh, well, <laughs> maybe they should have put a better foot forward in the first episode. I don't know. That was a 
That was a pretty convoluted first episode. Yeah, I wonder how things might have played better if they made the fifth episode the first episode. Because they seem to also, in before the show came out, they were leading with a lot of, like, preview clips from that fifth episode. Like, yeah. they played, like, the, they put, like, the first four minutes of that on YouTube, like, a month before the show premiered with, like... Uh, Jerry and Cronenberg Jerry, you know, meeting Mr. Nimbus. But boy, people didn't like the animation in that. <laughs> well, what they really didn't like was like the, you know, uh, still images like yeah. Yakuza fight scene the, at, that towards the end of the fifth but that episode. Was there are a lot of people criticizing. That was a stylistic choice. choice, pretty clearly. It was like a Osama Dezaki style postcard memory type of like freeze frame highlight. Though it would have been better if they did more of the Dezaki style of like you have kind of this three peak like pan, like fast pan to kind of kind of give you that energy of movement rather than just show the still frame. But mm. yeah, I mean, it was, to me, that's oh, well, that's a stylistic choice. I wouldn't doubt that the animation budget was up. Uh, was such that they could do something like super lavishly animated, like uh, you know the r regular Rick and Morty does some pretty like uh, intricate and well animated fight scenes, and I can think that is another fair criticism is that like the show isn't as you know fluidly animated as Rick and, Rick and Morty, and there's not as much like variety in terms of background characters and designs like. There is so many like complicated designs in regular Rick and Morty just in a single episode. And here you can tell that with the aliens, they've really got taken to have more simplified character designs. Um, mm. And so I think that works to be easier to animate, but it is a noticeable difference in terms of the complexity of the world and like the animation. So I think that is a fair criticism of like, yeah, that is a is criticism that I one. have because the designs are overall much, much simpler. So you yeah. think that they would do, you know, smoother, more dynamic animation, but they, they don't really do that. I mean, it looks fine. Most of the time there, there's some weird stuff every now and then. But. Yeah, I mean, it mostly looks good, but it just doesn't have, like, the same fluidity of movement and just as much going on as, like, regular Rick and Morty. And I think that's another thing that adds to kind of the feeling of the show being slow and that kind of, like, throwing people off and why mm. a lot of people might not, not be jiving with it as much. Mm-hmm. All right, so talkbacks. There were, uh, you know, a handful of uh, basically, this is awful, get rid of it. Oh. But my favorite <laughs> of them was Mr. Paws 54 writing, we still have a month of this goddamn show. Vegeta screaming about to go Majin. Oh, see, I <laughs> see. I, well, I understand people not like enjoying the show. It's hard for me to understand like the reaction of like being mad at it. I think, like, I, I watched Mutter's Basement, like, recent review of it, and he kind of oh, watched that too. conclusion that I, I could I'd agree with, where it's like, well, you know, it's just hard. And I, there's not much to get mad at, but there's also not much to latch onto. And while there's interesting stuff here, it's just not very well made. And I kind of have a better opinion of, like, the, the show in terms of, like, it being... More well away than I think Jeff is going to be credit for, but I would agree with that assessment. As I just don't think that there's a lot here to be offended by, or like it's like an um, to, that would be an unbearable experience. At worst, I think it'd be, I think it can be boring probably for people, but like I just don't understand the the anger to have towards it, or like who's forcing you to to sit and watch the show. Mm -hmm. um, there's just not anything that I think is like worth getting mad at i mean there's episodes of original rick and marty that i i'm not a big fan of that i that do generally frustrate me because the the message or just the execution uh leaves a bad taste but but this show especially because the place it's coming from is from a place of sincerity and empathy and like kind of just more like of a kind of optimistic positive outlook uh, on things it's like well it's it's 
well, I don't know what's really there to be mad at because the show is, it, it's not a mean spirited show or an angry show um, or a dismissive show or, or a show that's dismissive of anything. So yeah, it's, I, I, I can't quite gel with like the people who are like really mad at the show for, I think, for a lot, I think just there's there's shows who are of worse quality or like are worse in terms of like the the messages that they communicate or how they're executed or that like I think are more wordy of being upset at than this show. Oh, I would agree. It's at the end of the day, it's inoffensive. It's completely inoffensive. Yeah. That is the word I would use. Yeah, pretty inoffensive and just at worst you could dismiss it as it's like, oh, this is just fluff. It's just something that's on, but it's not something I'm latching on to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My uh, local friend's original impression of it is it exists. Mm -hmm. It's just there. <laughs> he has since kind of soured on it, and I don't think he's going to watch anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. may maybe I can convince him to come back to it when it's over. We'll see. Uh, this talk back from a video game couple would simply go watch Shin Chan. You know what? I, I recommend that. Absolutely wholeheartedly endorse that. Uh, I love Shin Chan. Shin Chan. So, you know, a lot of people would make art style comparisons, but like on Light Rick and Morty animation, Shin Chan does make full advantage for its character designs to have really excellent animation and not just in mm -hmm. the animation, but also in the directing. It can often be so dynamic. You know, you have a lot of like really talented animators who have worked on it over the years, like Masaki Wasa. So there are some pretty stunning looking Shin Chan episodes. And isn't uh, there know, a Shin Chan spinoff that's set in space? Yeah, there's like Shin Chan Aliens versus Shin. Like there's there were like four different like mini series that were available on Amazon Prime Video. I don't know if they're still available there, but those were pretty enjoyable watches uh, if you're a Shin Chan fan. But if you're looking for some sci-fi rigmarole, definitely Space Dandy. Yeah, Space Dandy is a good comp. And uh <laughs> Speaking of Jeff's review, since he brought it up, I'm going to go ahead and bring it up. Uh, if you want new sci-fi anime, Dead, Dead Demons, Day, 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 Destruction on Crunchyroll, it is an ocean dub. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. But it's it's apparently very high-quality sci-fi that nobody's paying attention to. Which is a crying shame because it absolutely is an incredible production. I mean, the manga, I remember when that manga first started and I'd been keeping up with it. I fell off at some point, but like it from reading the re reading through the ending, like it really comes together in a great way. Again, like just really great exploration of a lot of different teams, basically like, you know, kind of the daily life of people with the imminent threat of the end of the world and how they choose to go about their lives and treat each other and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, it, it explores a lot of interesting things, compelling characters, uh, you know, for, a, it starts out feeling like, Oh, it's going to be just a little more like low key slice of life, but then it takes like some darker turns so there's a lot of surprises and a lot of trills in the show. Uh, so definitely watch it. It is like a surprise and a shame that there just hasn't been much discussion of it. It's like one of those shows that is like the best things you are not watching. Kind of like a Yadagarasu. So, yeah. Uh, definitely a, one of the better best sci-fi anime to come out this well, year. Well, you heard it here, listeners. You heard it here. Check it out. Uh, at Austin underscore comics writes in. Interesting. Kind of distant, slow paced, but I am curious, so I keep watching. And similarly, at Rainbow War 71 writes in, I'm engaged with it. Not passionate, but I want to see what happens next. Yeah, I'm kind of on that, that similar wavelength there. And I think this one does a good summary here. Uh, Fuzzbutt <laughs> writes in, <laughs> like, obviously it's not Rick and Morty, but when you separate it 
from the OG show. It's actually pretty interesting. Like, it's not the best thing, but it's okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Meanwhile, Wolf Colt says, to be frank, I was never a fan of the OG, but I like the anime more. Well, there you yeah. go. There's somebody out there. <laughs> the nihilistic approach of original Rick and Morty isn't for everyone. And mm -hmm. though it might be a bit of a tough... Uh, a, a, a tough barrier what with all of the lore specific stuff in it i think you could probably introduce this to somebody who's never seen rick and morty before just to see what they think of it yeah it'd be interesting i wonder if the best way to do that would even be start with that actual first episode or like maybe choose episode five as like the most standalone yeah. probably easier to kind of get a, a acclimated to and you or... attached to the character and this kind of goes along with Paul's line of thinking that he, he feels that this is above the grade of more recent Rick and Morty that, you know, if you checked out Rick and Morty and you thought, ah, this really isn't for me, but you watched a handful of episodes, you're familiar with the characters, try this out. It might be more to your taste. Yeah, especially if what you wanted from regular Rick and Morty was more of a story driven approach. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Akeem Moore writes in, it's interesting, but it's a watered down version of the original show. It's all right, but the animation style is weak. Fair. Mm -hmm. I will say, I think the character designs look good in that style. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them really pop. Like, I, I really like how Mr. Nimbus looks. Uh, I like Space Bats. Yeah, Space Bats. Morty's teacher. <laughs> Morty's teacher was in, like, those with the commandos. That was that was something. Yeah, we saw that, like, twice Mr. Golden Paul was, like, leading a resistance group in this show. Yeah. Game Gray VR writes in, kind of mid. I've been told it was animated in Microsoft Paint, and if that's true, that's fucking impressive. No. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but You know, Microsoft Paint gets a <laughs> bad rap, but you can create, like, interesting-looking pieces of art in that. Or you could. I don't know if that <laughs> program is even still around. But, like, I played around with it when I was, like, a, a high school kid or whatever. But, like, yeah, yeah I, you, there, there's this definite style because it's all pixely and whatnot it's, right but like this is definitely yeah, not the not the tool that they are using to animate Rick no the anime <laughs> the, the, no if you want to actually see something animated in ms paint it's like a it's a joke but it's very funny it's like the there's an episode of gintama where the joke is like oh we didn't have the budget to to use regular <laughs> opening so they have a version of the opening in ms paint it's in it's one of the episodes in the popularity poll arc, which is like in the the one eighties. But yeah, that that was a funny, funny that, joke that, about that is a paint thing that animation. Gintama can do, and we all appreciate it. Oh yes, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Lord Terminal writes in: Everyone rags on the animation and the art style, but the real problem with the spinoff was the confusing and incoherent storytelling. Otherwise, it's been mid. Well, yeah, I, I mean, hope I if you've been listening to this conversation that maybe Lum has given you a different perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I think the more the show has gone on, the more it's easier to piece like the points in the narrative together and how they all fit and correlate yeah. with each other. But yeah. I also think it's fair that, yeah, like especially in the early episodes, it was very disorienting. It's uh, still to go disorienting, from... but I don't think it's incoherent anymore. Early yeah. on, it was a bit incoherent. It was like, boy, that episode sure had a lot of stuff happen in it. I don't know what any of it means, but <laughs> such, is, yeah. such is the way it goes. <laughs> so now, now we this have is interesting. To piece together a timeline. So, yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, some, somebody will do it. Uh 
This is, this is going to be a hot take, considering uh, the uh, overall praise we gave this episode. But apparently, Kevin Davis feels otherwise. The story is confusing, and the enjoyment level has been low, especially in episode five. That episode was mm -hmm. awful. My favorite thing so far, the opening song, and the fact that it is airing in Japanese audio. I wish more anime would air subbed. Well, okay. you're going to get that again with did, Lisa Monkey. So. Did, uh, yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> you are indeed getting... Uh, Uzumaki, and since we brought up Uzumaki, we can now confirm that the third episode is also longer than standard. So episodes two, three, and four will all fill a 45-minute time slot, which means it's probably like 30-ish minute episodes. Well, I thought that the second episode is actually only fitting a 35-minute slot, and then they're like repeating set Rick and Morty Samurai and Shogun for the next 10 minutes. Oh. Or something like that. Possibly. So maybe yeah, it's not slightly consistent. Longer. Maybe it's not consistent. Hmm. Okay. Well, I hope at least some of the episodes are 30 minutes, because it kind of needs it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a short manga, but not short enough to cover everything in four episodes. So, I mean, I'm expecting them to, like, skip certain episodic chapters but yeah right. the more runtime i think probably the better for the show though i will say pacing wise having seen and reviewed the first episode i think it's doing a great job of intercutting different stories simultaneously and making it work as like a narrative so i'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the rest of the show plays out as an adaptation interesting I have seen the first episode. I'm still working on my review as of this recording, but I am not familiar with the manga at all. So I didn't know how well or not well it was incorporating the story. So that, that's interesting. Huh. And you that's don't a need cool to approach. elaborate, but that is. No, I won't. I will say uh, it just it adapts. A, I'll just say the first episode adapts like uh, a few different chapters and not necessarily like chapters one through four. There, it, it takes elements from later on too. So it's hmm. interesting. That is interesting. That is interesting. Okay. All right. But uh, yeah, I, I almost wonder if this guy is talking. Was it episode five? Did was it a typo? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's what he typed. Anyway, moving on. At Journeyman15 writes in, Ellen, the bit of Tammy's backstory, even though it's not the Tammy we once knew, have been have made things really interesting, at least. But the music in the Japanese performances have been wonderful. I just wish it wasn't Sano directing. Hmm. Okay, I will go and say Sano's shorts were not my favorite Rick and Morty anime shorts. I think the the Akihabara one is my favorite. Yeah, that's my favorite. And that one, I think, had a sense of humor that's not like quite like the regular series, but it was pretty funny. It was like humor for a short. And I think if like the series is more that style, a lot more people would have like kind of grooved with it a little better. That one was also like more had more send ups of like anime tropes and things too. So if more of those elements were in the show, I think also people would have like kind of again jived with the idea of this is a Rick and Morty anime. Mm, yeah, I, I think more people would have been receptive to that, or rather, that more people were expecting something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well. I, I couldn't speak for that director uh, that did the Akihabara short if whether or not they have the same clear level of passion for the material that uh, Sano obviously does. So, I don't know. But hey, give give that guy a crack at a season. <laughs> let's see. Let's see what that uh, that can bring to the table. It'd be interesting if they treated this series as kind of like an anthology and they had like different yeah. directors brought on each season. So, well, yeah, we could get a Masaru Matsumoto season. 
and I'd be interested to see like what that would be like. But he's only been like director on that short. Like he's a CG director on most other productions he's worked on, or mm. like a he's an episode director on like the the Sound and Fury like kind of a uh, mini series of like music videos. But like in terms of like a narrative short, Rick and Morty, Gokai Battle Back Hour is like oh, the only thing like sh- short he's directed. Ah, uh, yeah. I would like to see what other directors would potentially cook up for this. Like I'd love to see Shingo Natsumi's take on Rick and Morty or mm. let's, let's let's kick it way back. Let's get Mitsuru Hongo. Yeah. They still got him on speed dial, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think everyone would be really enthused about the idea of like a trigger adaptation of Rick and Morty. Oh yeah. Trigger Rick and Morty. Oh my gosh, the Trigger Transformers thing was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Just oh, no matter what version of Transformers was your favorite, you got a little, you got a little something in there at least. They lovely, they covered, lovely. I think, absolutely everything, which is an accomplishment because there is a lot of Transformers series, a lot of Transformers series. But as an aside. I also saw Transformers 1, and it's pretty good. People should go see it. It didn't do very well the first weekend. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. I, I still need to see it myself, but I, I w- I've been pretty looking forward to it. So, yeah. I hate to go off on a tangent here because I could probably get Paul going on this one. But <laughs> I really feel like movie trailers just aren't good these days. They just don't do a good job of making you want to see the movie. movie <laughs> like trailer, even the say? trailer. Yeah. Some of the trailers for Deadpool and Wolverine, I was like, I, I want to see this movie less now. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. I loved it. I saw it three times, but yeah, I don't, a lot of people I've, I've seen comment that the initial trailer for Transformers one really put them off. And yeah, okay, Maybe it's uh, a bit much to focus on the uh, dynamic of soon-to-be Optimus Prime and Megatron being buddies, but that's yeah, this yeah that that is the story. It is it is their friendship coming to an end as things change on Cybertron. I mean, yeah, I heard from critics that review the film who I follow that their initial impressions was that the film was going to skew for a much younger audience than the tone of the film actually is like, because the trailer did focus on more of the jokey and humorous Mm -hmm. aspects of the movie, as opposed to, to the central, you know, friendship and then later conflict between Optimus and Megatron. So in that way, yeah, it's the trailer sort of misrepresented what is like kind of the interesting part about the movie. Yeah, well, hopefully positive word of mouth will help. Though that really low IGN review ain't going to help. No. Also, (laughs) IGN's the only one that gave Uzumaki an 8. Everybody else gave it a 9. Oh, IGN. I mean, (laughs) that ain't so bad. At least they didn't complain that it's like too many spirals or something. Too many spirals? (laughs) I'll tell you right now, like... That... Zero out of ten, too many spirals. <laughs> Transformers really didn't do that well. It's opening weekend, yeah. so I'm not. Yeah, that's I, too I'm bad. not confident that it's going to be. I know for a fact that if it doesn't pick up at all, it's going to be gone from my place after this week. Probably, oh, that's so. too yeah. bad because but... what a great double feature with the Wild Robot. Yeah, or with the Gundam film re-releases I mean, it, that it are coming. May end up, it, it may end up being the second movie with like wild robot, but you know, this week it's not. <laughs> so, I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see what happens. So, I mean, the one perhaps like positive thing it might have going for it is that because it is more of a family film, or at least like, it's like an audience that is like inclusive of like both kids and adults, it might have like longer legs in the same way. Other films that kind of open to a, low 
opening numbers like Elemental and Migration ended up sticking it out quite a bit at the box office for a number of weeks. You know, it just yeah. had good like long term business, but just not short term opening. It didn't pull in a great box office in the opening weekend. Yeah. Uh, again, hopefully positive word of mouth. Because it seems like a, a, a perfectly good reintroduction of the franchise the same way that Mutant Mayhem was for Turtles. Which yeah. I will say, as I recall, Turtles didn't do fantastic its opening weekend, but it had some legs. So yeah. maybe the same will happen with Transformers. I hope so. Yeah. Family but there's one more seven. talk back. Oh. I know I really deviated, but there's one more talk back. <laughs> It just seemed weird to be like, we're talking about movies, and then I'm like, but then there's one more talk back, <laughs> and I was like, but I still want to talk about movies. <laughs> just had to get that off my chest. All right. <laughs> Make Shifter writes in the longest talk back that we got. Oh. It feels half baked. A fun idea if it was treated as a separate universe than C137, like maybe C137 anime. Yeah, see, that's kind of... They say he's C-137, Rick, but it's so very clearly not the yeah, versions no. that we are familiar with because they're just not characterized the same. So it's like, this is... This, even if they're saying he's C-137, this is an alternate version of Rick and Morty mm -hmm. and these characters. So I wouldn't place it into the canon of regular Rick and Morty. Oh, way. no, absolutely not. It, does, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're saying... It could be C one three seven A. Yeah. Nime in <laughs> in brackets. <laughs> Since the series has pulled that type of joke before, he also feels that the a lot of the VAs need better direction. Though Lucy Christian did fantastic as always. I think for the most part, the voice cast is doing an admirable job filling these I shoes. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would criticize is that they try to recreate Rick and Morty's like stutters in a way that I don't feel is like very natural or like fitting in. Yeah, the I, don't, I don't think because... I don't think the the Morty actor is quite getting it. But I do think no. Joe Daniels incorporates Rick's mannerisms pretty well. Yeah, he has Joe Daniels has good range in terms of his performance as Rick in terms of like kind of playing up when he's more excitable, but also when he's kind of mm -hmm. more serious. I do feel like Morty's actor, he kind of has just one tone of voice and that is kind of distracting or takes me mm -hmm. out of a moment where Morty is like being more sincere, but then the, the performance kind of uses a stutter and tries to turn what really isn't, what I don't think was dialogue meant to be a joke into kind of a joke in how he's mm -hmm. reacting. And it just doesn't work, especially when I watch the sub and then I'm like, well, this is not how the execution is feels in the sub at all. No, it's very, very different. Actor, but, yeah. yeah. Morty's just kind of a soft spoken guy in the sub. Yeah. <laughs> but, he's just, he's uh, very earnest and like I, sincere. <laughs> wide eyed. I, I think yeah. I think Morty has gotten better throughout these episodes. But in the first episode, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, just very awkward directory deliveries and reactions. I know so many people criticize and were like, why is he just going, ah, ah, there's so many reactions like that so much. Like, just the way he did it, it was just kind of a little jarring and distracting. Yeah. So. But credit where it's due they're also managing to you know act emotionally doing that voice which mm -hmm. isn't the easiest thing to you know balance yeah something mm -hmm. that amused me is I, I was watching the dangers in my heart season two dub recently and one of the teachers it's it's definitely the same kind of voice that joe daniels is doing for jerry <laughs> <laughs> i was like <laughs> the teacher's cherry. Ah, fun, fun stuff. I think Joe Daniels is also just the best, like, more humorous line to the referees. Like, when Jerry's saying, I made space berry cake. Yeah, I, lo I love that delivery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that delivery. Yeah, that's great. 
Oh, that's that's such a that that's another like cultural difference thing. Like Jerry refers to himself as Papa in the Japanese one, and like our Jerry would never, <laughs> never. That's that's not how mm-hmm. he talks. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, more from Big Shifter. Felt the animation needed a better budget. The art style could have worked, but it felt like it was missing something, and that the writing is a bit out of place. It's a similar situation with uh, Ruby, the Ice Queendom, where the writing felt too serious and lacked the series' usual charm. All in all, if it gets a season two, it has potential to do better. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Yeah, that's that's fair. They're not the first person to make the comparison to how it feels compared to the original with uh, regards to Ruby, the Ice Queendom anime versus the actual Ruby. Yeah. (laughs) And this, yeah. I never watched Ice Queendom, but from what I had seen, it wasn't, it didn't really have like the sense of humor the original Ruby would employ. Which is, but also hearing that criticism, I know the fact a lot of people actually criticized the humor and later Ruby that they felt clashed with like the more serious direction the story took. So, hmm. yeah, that's the that's the thing about stories that rely a lot on jokiness. When they get serious, you're you're having a hard time balancing when to have levity. And this is something that, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe struggles with constantly now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's tough. <laughs> I don't envy writers that have to balance those things, because it ain't easy. Especially when you make so many self-referential jokes, or, like, I rolling jokes, so, like, oh, isn't this element from the comics ridiculous, and we're pointing it out? And then you're like, well, you were asking us to invest in this world and in yeah. this character still. <laughs> Where's so, the like, sincerity? I, it it kind of takes us out to, like, have people, like, make fun of Doc Ock's name. It's like, okay, so is this a character we were supposed to take seriously or not? Okay, they're... They're teenagers about to get into college, but still, that that was, yeah. that was pretty childish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like your name is Doctor Octavius. You <laughs> have eight arms. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll admit I was at least a little amused by that. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean that that movie worked. Uh, that was that yeah, was one scene I, I like where it's like, movie. yeah, it's, that's that that's an it's example like, why, of the kind of scene. Why are you? That, yeah. Why are you? Like, why are you antagonizing this man? <laughs> Yeah. Also, <laughs> like you're trying to cooperate with him, and now you're antagonizing and making fun of his name. Like you know, luckily he's the mature adult in the situation, and he can take a little bit of. Yeah, the mature you know. adult suffering from <laughs> mental illness that makes him a violent murderer. He's but, very uh, well adjusted once they fix the chip. <laughs> Well, yeah, once they fix it, you know, they, they <laughs> prove his state of mental health quite a bit. And then he can be like, oh, I can think clearly now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but I loved Alfred Molina in that movie. He was so good. Yeah. Highlight for sure. Yeah. Okay. If you have any additional commentary on Rick and Morty the anime for the upcoming episodes, you can hit us up with the hashtag Toonami Talkback or respond to the tweet when we make it. Or you can email us at podcast at toonamipeople.com. And here's the rest of the house cleaning. You can follow us on facebook.com backslash Toonami Faithful Podcast and on Twitter at Toonami Podcast. You can listen to the podcast on just about everything, including Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Overcast, PodBay, PodBean, Podcast Addict, Radio.com, Spotify, and the TuneIn app. And you can find every episode of the podcast stream online at SoundCloud.com backslash Toonami Faithful Podcast. And get the latest news by following at Toonami News on Twitter. And read the news, views, and reviews on ToonamiFaithful.com. And if you haven't listened to our interview that we did with Joe Daniels, the voice of Rick and Jerry, and also Jason Cardenas and Ninja Kamui, you should definitely listen to that. It's great. 
It's on our SoundCloud. It I'm guessing it's also on the YouTube, Paul. Is it on YouTube? Paul? Yes, it's on YouTube. Know. Yes. For a second, I thought we lost Paul in another dimension. <laughs> He's in the antiverse. Oh, time's moving backwards for him. <laughs> he wishes. <laughs> he wishes time was moving backwards. <laughs> yeah, I could get more sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to have to wait uh, about a month. <laughs> little, 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 that, little, little, little more than a month, and then, then you can get some more sleep. <laughs> Don't remind me, please. Because fall back, baby! wonder what Toonami is going to do for that this time. We shall see. We shall see. Speaking of Toonami schedules, yeah, we, we have the schedule... Uh, as previously mentioned on the podcast that uh, has some uh, adjusted start time. So as a reminder, this week, everything's normal. This upcoming week, everything's normal. With the premiere of Uzumaki, we have Rick and Morty the anime in Japanese at midnight, followed by the Japanese premiere of Uzumaki, which is also the world premiere that will be at 12.30, standard length episode for the first week. Followed by Demon Slayer, continuing the Swordsmith Village arc. And then just one episode of One Piece at 1.30. Followed by DBZ Kai at 2. And two episodes of My Hero Academia at 2.30 and 3. And then the next week... Things get a little bit wonky for the next three weeks because we still have Rick and Morty, the anime at midnight. Then Uzumaki is at 12.30, but it will end at 12.45. No, at not, not 12.45. <laughs> it will end at uh, 1.15 instead of 1 a.m. So at 1.15, everything has just moved down. So Demon Slayer, One Piece... DBZ Kai, two episodes of My Hero Academia, all offset by 15 minutes from the regular schedule. But on the October 17th, yes, on October 17th, that will be the night that Rick and Morty, the anime, Uzumaki, and Demon Slayer's current arc all end, which means Demon Slayer will also be longer. So that night, there's no One Piece. And everything is still offset by 15 minutes. A little confusing, perhaps. Uh, eh. <laughs> Just look at the schedule. <laughs> but in general, after Uzumaki, everything is 15 minutes later, starting the second week that Uzumaki airs. Okay, okay, got it, cool. And we still have no idea how they're going to fill three time slots in November. But... New York Comic Con is coming up, so maybe something will be said there. Yeah, maybe. New York Comic Con will be weekend of the 17th to 20th of October. And Adult Swim does have panels at uh, New York Comic Con. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Lazarus panel is going to be there. There's going to be, you know, another night of uh, premieres. So they most likely will probably make some kind of announcement. As particularly at the Lazarus panel, if there's going to be any Tanami related announcement, I'm sure DeMarco will tack it on at the end, uh, like with the Uzumaki news at the end of the Rick and Morty panel at San Diego Comic Con. So we'll probably get something there, hopefully. Though apparently there there won't be a full episode of Lazarus. It'll no, be they'll probably just show clips, some, maybe. Yeah. Like small clip sneak peek. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a little underwhelming. So it could still be a while before that is ready to air. I yeah. I personally think that Rooster Fighter might actually be ready sooner. Well, we also haven't seen any extended um, things from Rooster Fighter beyond the trailer, too. So No, but Viz doesn't tend to announce things really far in advance. But at the same time, it feels like this is a co-production, you know, with Adult Swim. 
So, True. and you know, Adult True. Swim announced Uzumaki five years before it. I mean, let's not out. make everything a comparison to Uzumaki. No, that's that's an extreme <laughs> case and a very different kind of production. But yeah, I wouldn't. I don't know. I think Lazarus probably is a little further on because we actually have seen some full clips of Lazarus um, mm. at SDCC and now at NYCC. Uh, so I think. If it, even if it probably won't come like in the next few months, I think that it's, it's probably further along enough that we'll see it like earlier mid twenty twenty five. Booster Fighter, I'm I'm not quite sure yet. I think we we'll, we could see it in twenty twenty five, but so far with just the one trailer, I don't I don't know how far along with it it will is because all the scenes in the trailer too were just stuff that would be in the first episode. So. Mm-hmm. And it was more of a proof of concept trailer, really. Yeah. Which they've done before, like they did with Fena. Uh, well, I suppose they didn't really do that with Ninja Kamui. That was actually episode one footage that they showed us, and everybody was just surprised that the main character looks so different. <laughs> yeah. When we got to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he was camouflaged, so, <laughs> you know... Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if yeah. I remember correctly, that Fen and Proof of Concept, that, that aired like a year before we actually ended up seeing the full series. Yeah, some something like that. Ooh, I think it was, yeah, pretty much exactly a year because... Yeah, I guess it was like in July of whatever year, and the next year in August is when the show came out. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Hmm, interesting. Hey, did you know Fena came out on uh, Blu-ray in Japan? Really? Dang. I, I can't verify that per se, but that I uh, somebody was showing the uh, box art for Ninja Kamui's Blu-ray release, and I questioned whether or not another Toonami original has come out. And they said Fena did. So it's out there. I wonder if it has a dub of the, as an extra. English that one. would be interesting. Or if at least have subtitles in English. A yeah. Lot. That's becoming more commonplace with Japanese Blu-rays. Yeah. Since they share a region. <laughs> Alas, if only Crunchyroll or WBD did that, uh, did Blu-ray for Feta before right? they, WBD wrote it off and Crunchyroll, I'm sure, has no interest yeah. putting the show on physical disc. Ah, <sighs> boy. Yeah. That's a shame. And it's a shame. But you can still stream the Japanese version on Crunchyroll. Mm. If you care. <laughs> uh, a sad fate. Even though it was hardly a fantastic show in the end, it's still an unfortunate fate for any show to end up in. Yeah. But uh, I digress. Uh... We will, of course, keep you posted on any uh, actual tsunami news as it occurs. But I just I just got to put this out here. Those of you who were expecting Crunchyroll to get Dragon Ball Diamond exclusively, that didn't happen. It is also going to be on Hulu same day mm -hmm. for the sub. And the dub will premiere in theaters the first three episodes the first episode being an extended episode so that yeah, that's a pretty good length three episodes yeah the extended part of that first episode is like it's a 10 minute kind of recap or re uh, recap of like dragon ball z basically oh i think particularly the boo arc because uh, daima is like so heavily it seems tied to the boo arc so but like even I, in the trailer for Naima, you can see like a shot of like Goku's like spirit bomb against Kid Buu, or like Goku giving like kind of that, you know, uh, pose right before he like blasts Kid Buu with it. It's very likely that Toei will want this on TV too, and it could very yeah. likely end up on Tsunami even before the end of the year. Though that yeah. might be a bit ambitious, but I mean they're putting four episodes, no, three three episodes in theaters. On November 11th, who's to say they can't start playing the first episode on Toonami on November 16th? Yeah, it could I happen. could totally see, you know, after the theatrical screening, they pl start playing the show on Toonami. 
No. It could end up not happening until like January. I mean, honestly, if they don't do it on November 16th, there's kind of no point in starting it after until January because of all the holidays. Yeah, I mean, they could probably get from the 30th through the 14th, like those three episodes and yeah. break for the holidays and then back in the start of 2025. But yeah, they could. See. But yeah, but the I other thing about uh, Toonami's openings in November is I've been projecting that Invincible Fight Girl is very likely for one of those. But curiously, as far as I could tell, it's not getting any coverage at at New York Comic Con. No, it it's not being shown as part of the 90 new screening. There's no panel for it. So hmm. who? Uh, it's curious. You would think that if there was Fork coming, they they do some more promotional push at it at New York Comic Con. So maybe it's going to be a little more time before we see the the full series. Even though the first episode, I mean, it's uh, it's all done. If people yeah, can watch it's, it, it's done. I'm I'm pretty sure yeah. the whole thing is done. And I seem to recall Chorus in Canada had it listed as one of the fall shows for Adult Swim oh. Canada. So well, if, for it to be Canada, fall, it would have to be in November. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not point. happening any sooner than that. So in that case, yeah, I don't know why then they wouldn't promote it at New York Comic Con, but then it could still be a possibility that it does show anyway. Maybe it'd be like one of those like announcement things where they're like, oh, at the end of the Lazarus panel, like, yeah, here's some upcoming Super Denali in the future. Here's a clip of Invisible Fight Girl. It's going to come in November. You know, I mean, yeah, they did, it's not like they did a Uzumaki panel at it. San Diego Comic Con, even though the yeah. show is coming out two months later. So, yeah, maybe yeah. not everything gets that promotional push. It's entirely plausible. Yeah, just because it's not mentioned in the press materials doesn't mean that it will never come up in the entirety of their, you know, events. Yeah, and I hope that they at least mention it at some point. <laughs> Because, the, yeah, they they uh, if it's if it's coming in November, they definitely should do that. So, those are some possibilities, and also because they doubled up my hero, they're getting through the season six pretty fast. They could speed that up even more with like a rerun marathon. <laughs> Make use of that extra time the first Saturday of November. (laughs) I'm sure there's going to be an Uzumaki marathon on October 26th. It feels like a missed opportunity not to do a Halloween marathon. And they could run the dub, which would technically be a Toonami premiere. (laughs) Oh, yeah. There you go. I'm also really wondering if Uzumaki's dub will be on Max the next day. Probably, just like with Rick and Morty. I mean, that would be very helpful for our coverage purposes, because I know I can't wrangle some of these folks to watch something subtitled. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think the one criticism I have with the subs is because the show is in black and white and the subtitles are white, sometimes I think maybe the subs could get you know, lost or the screen might be too busy to like read them oh. legibly. So that might mm. be an issue, especially if like you're sitting very far away from your TV screen or whatever. I wonder so, if that's how it'll look on television though, as opposed yeah. to Max. I really, I thought it was going to be yellow. Yeah. I remember it was yellow in the trailers, kind of but like, I'm just wondering from like the because the screeners that you know we were provided were white subtitles, um. So like yeah, that that's was one thing I was noticing with that. It's like oh, I mm. that might be a, a legibility issue if you're colorblind or you just are sitting far away and <laughs> you can't make it out. Yeah, potentially. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. But, uh, yeah, stuff happening on Toonami. It's it's finally happening. Uzumaki, next week. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to have so much 
to talk about in Tanami now because there was like this period of like, oh, there's kind of a dirt of new things on Tanami, but now it's like, oh, here's something, and then there's a lot to look forward to in the immediate future, or like at least we hope will come in the immediate future. So I think it's a it's a good spot for the market to be in. Yeah, it's promising. It looks it looks promising, but I think that'll probably do it. So, Lum, tell the fine people where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me on the interwebs on the website formerly known as Twitter as at LumRamiyasha. I'm also on Letterbox, Anulus, Amateur Revelation, wherever there's a LumRamiyasha, you'll find me there by that name. You can read my reviews and interviews and listen to my podcast on MangaMavericks.com. And you can follow us on X and other social media at manga underscore mavericks. As mentioned before, we have a review of the first episode of Uzumaki as part of our Saturday Night Shocky podcast, which is very fitting considering this is a Shigaku-Kan anime that is airing on Saturday night. So this has been probably the most appropriate uh, podcast uh, to, to make use of that title. But I also have a written review that you can read as well the first episode. So covering in about audio and written form. And uh, potentially we will have more Uzumaki coverage of more like reviews of future episodes. We have a podcast we recorded about the manga that we recorded like a year ago when we thought the show was going to come out last October. But uh, we'll finally release that podcast on the manga in the coming month. And then we will have a like full series uh, review podcast for the anime once the anime is done by the end of October. That will most likely be available on our Patreon, patreon.com slash manga, where you can also find other bonus podcasts that we produce, like series covering Hajime no Ippo and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and various one-offs covering like different manga and anime or films. So look forward to more of that content on there and your support really helps us continue to uh, do the work that we have been doing with the site in terms of doing all our convention coverage, our press coverage and reviews and podcasts. So we really would appreciate support and we do appreciate the, your support and listenership and readership. Uh, in addition to Manga Mavericks, also you can find on our website Lum Squad, the Yurusi Yatsura podcast I do, discussing the wonderful wacky world of Rumba Hashi's classic sci-fi rom-com series. And we have a lot of podcasts uh, in the works for that to cover the rest of the manga and then the rest of the reboot anime now that that finished. And also we'll probably talk a little bit about Ranma with the Ranma and Half reboot coming out on Netflix in just a week or so. And I'm very excited for that. It's a really good time to be a Rumiko Takahashi fan. Lots going on with her series. That's really exciting. So look forward to more episodes from there. You can follow that podcast and social media at lum underscore squad. And if you like the art I make, the thumbnails I draw for our podcast or the animations and illustrations I do in general, you can find that stuff on my Instagram at SidArtWorks. Okay. Save some things to plug for the rest of us, why don't you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get to follow that, Paul. I mean, I mean, I almost fell asleep twice already, so. Oh, no. <laughs> That's fair. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Paul Pascrillo. You can email me, paulpascrillo at tsunamifaithful.com. And, uh, yeah, you can find me on various other podcasts, which I hope to be podcasting more once the drive-in closes for the season and as Sketch alluded in, well, I wish it was a month, but it's more like six six or seven weeks away, so. Okay. And where can they find you, sir? You can find me on Twitter at Sketch1984. I'm also on Blue Sky Sketch1984. And, yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. Uh, I, I have to say, I've been doing my ninja homework... I finished reading the manga of Naruto. 
I finished it from, I started around chapter 350. That is half mm -hmm. of the of the 700 chapters of Naruto. <laughs> and I gotta say, I enjoyed myself. You know, there's parts of it that I have some issue with, but I'm honestly really excited to talk about it. And while I was thinking of just doing one Naruto discussion, possibly with some guests, now I'm thinking we should have multiple. I'm Thanks. sure Kuro would be down for that because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, listeners. I'm so sorry. We <laughs> didn't even do a discussion of the pain arc of Naruto <laughs> Shippuden. I'm so sorry that we completely overlooked that among other great moments in the latter part of Naruto. That is, that is our bad. Very much so. Mostly my bad. But also, I, I didn't really have anybody else, like, pushing me to do anything with Naruto. For, for, I think Kuro I, was the sole enthusiast <laughs> on staff who was, like, actively watching. Kind of. I mean, Darrell really it. likes Naruto, too, but he doesn't really bring that up, much less anything. <laughs> we got to get Darrell back on this podcast soon. He's been very busy with his diving diving certification so we're we're very happy that that's going well for him but we I'll want doing, to hear him again some, i'll be doing some diving into my bed once you you study you uh, <laughs> no. podcast. oh I, I see i see i see how it is i see how it is but yeah yeah we'll we'll definitely talk some naruto in maybe not this month <laughs> well this month's almost over maybe not in october but maybe I'll squeeze something in. I kind of feel like it'd be fun to do like an episode where we talk about Uzumaki and Naruto. <laughs> Double Uzumakis. And you know what? The one time we had a Naruto focused episode, I already used Uzumaki Barrage as a title. Dang it. <laughs> now I got to come up with something else. Tuzumaki. Tu oh, that's good. I'm stealing that. <laughs> I'm stealing that. <laughs> Probably. Okay. Well, if you've been listening to this conversation, we hope that uh, you have enjoyed it. We we hope you've enjoyed our commentary and your commentary as well as we read some of your commentary. And thanks for your commentary. Thanks for you for sharing. Uh, I know we didn't get everybody, but you know we kind of can't. <laughs> It would go on for way, way too long. And I feel like I I gathered a healthy amount of talkbacks this time. So sorry if we didn't read yours. But again, thank you for listening. Please share the podcast with your friends if you think they'd be interested. And until next time, we're punching out. <laughs>